Our phones are now the center of our lives. They track our every move, our every call. Police emergency. And for police, they have become the key to solving crimes. This series is about the unique calls that cracked open Australia's most shocking murder cases. It's taking a sinister turn. Voices from beyond the grave. He's got blood everywhere. Calls you've never heard before. You might have been shot. The amazing stories of how today's telephone calls brought Australia's most horrific murderers to justice. It's horrible. would trigger an extraordinary murder investigation involving bondage. There were things like handcuffs present. Revenge and greed. He said there's money missing from his account. Tonight, the brutal killing of Peter Shellard. He sounded scared. A wealthy businessman adored by his family and friends. He was just outrageous with a very eccentric streak. It probably isn't really a sensible thing to do. A bizarre case that had more questions than answers. Some aspects were certainly suggestive of sexual activity. Plus, for the first time tonight, you'll hear the phone calls... They probably tortured Peter. ..that led to the solving of the case. Saturday, the 7th of May, 2005. And Shirley Withers arrived home at the house she shared most nights with her boyfriend of four years, Peter Shellard. Shirley bought some takeaway and goes straight to Peter's house. Puts a takeaway in the kitchen and goes looking for Peter. She finds the bludgeoned body of Peter Shellard in the bedroom. She rang Triple A. It was a distraught call reporting the discovery of uh, this gruesome finding of the death of her partner. Police and emergency services. My God! My partner, he's tied up on the floor. There's blood everywhere. Blood everywhere? Is that correct? Police were called to the North Caulfield property shortly before 7 o'clock last night. The body of Peter Shellard was discovered by his partner, who was believed to have been living with the millionaire for some time. Within minutes, the police and the forensic pathologist had arrived. The crime scene was not just startling, but puzzling. It's the old situation of the crime that's got to tell you a story. How do you interpret that crime scene? His body was in one of the bedrooms. He was wearing boxer shorts. There was a uh, blood-soaked pillowcase uh, near to the body, and he was uh, tied up with some rope. There were ties on the body, leather straps, things like that. Some aspects were certainly suggestive of some sort of sexual activity. Others did not seem to be connected with sexual activity. For example, when we started to uncover the body, we could see that there were some injuries to the head and also some injuries to the arms. So it's very difficult to infer exactly what was going on. So you need to learn a lot more about the background of the deceased, which might then add to what you're finding at that particular crime scene. Why would someone want to kill this person? 56-year-old Peter Shellard was a multi-millionaire. He was worth over $15 million from dealing in real estate and new and used Rolls-Royce motor cars and parts. He loved money and making money and saving money. Even though divorced, Liz Shellard still has a soft spot for her first husband. 
I met Peter when I was 28 and he was 38. So I was attracted to Peter's sense of humour and his twinkly blue eyes. He was just outrageous, some of the stories and some of the things he did. Because normally you'd expect people with wealth to behave in a conservative manner. And he was far from conservative, so he loved breaking all the rules. He was a character and he was always up to mischief of sorts. <laughs> he had a letterhead, the, sort of the scales of justice on the top of the letterhead, and it had the public defender. And uh, he would use these letterheads to take on the bureaucracy. From anyone's point of view, they're hilarious, except if you're involved in them. <laughs> Dragging people into court or just simply stirring the pot was a bit of a game for Peter. Peter Shallard was an eccentric person, to put it uh, in mild terms. Um, he rubbed people up the wrong way. Most of it had to do with his heritage-listed mansion, Rose Craddock. It was built in 1857 in the exclusive Melbourne suburb of North Caulfield. It was prime real estate, a very prosperous area of Melbourne and Peter burnt the historic garden to the ground. When the fire brigade arrived, Peter wasn't happy. They started up their hoses, and next minute Peter attacked the hoses with the chainsaw. I was charged with it and I paid for the hoses. It probably uh, isn't really a sensible thing to do, but in the spur of the moment... Uh, one, <laughs> You're a bit excited, uh, were you? Uh, one uh, gets... Uh, a little, a little excited. Peter suffered from bipolar, which is just like severe mood swings, really. When he was high, he was very energetic and, you know, he'd get the tractor out at three in the morning and start churning up the soil ready to flat potatoes or something. And then if he was depressed, he'd need a lot of sleep and then there was a brief period in between where he'd be quite normal. Peter also put up a wired fence, brought in shipping containers for his Rolls Royce, and kept chickens. His neighbours having no idea about his bipolar disorder. What well, looks like a concentration camp, if you want my opinion. <laughs> I've had more complaints about this property than any other property in the whole of Caulfield. I've had um, an injunction taken ag out against him because he put a load of manure here. And when I opened the door, he screamed something about elephant shit. So basically, it was a lot of people didn't like Peter Shallard. I think he did it for entertainment. He enjoyed it. Like, some people go out and have a game of tennis with their friends, or some people go off to the football. He'd love to get involved in a tussle. The question was whether it had killed him. Detectives also discovered Peter enjoyed being tied up. Well, the first I knew about Peter's interest in bondage was he told me that he'd met a guy uh, who'd introduced him to um, a club called the Hellfire Club. Now, with Peter, he always embraced things full on. He was going every second night or, you know, he was going a lot. He became very interested in it, but for a very short time. As a joke one time, he invited a lot of these company directors and so on to his 50th birthday, and when they got to the address, it was some bondage club. But another, another total joke by Shallard. But amongst the laughs, Peter also saw a business opportunity. He wanted to start up his own club. So he was um, approaching the staff at the Hellfire Club and trying to poach them for his own club. So it wasn't just an interest. It was always, well, I can make money out of this and do my own one and do it better. So, within a few short hours of Peter's horrific murder, detectives had many leads to follow, including looking closer to home. Peter Shellard had two ex-wives and three daughters who adored their father 
and were devastated by his death. In the last four years, he had shared his life with Shirley Withers. The 38-year-old divorcee found Peter murdered and rang the police. He's up on the floor. There's blood everywhere. What's your name? Shirley. Look, in any investigation, the person who finds the body automatically becomes a person of interest. Shirley, was it? Until we're satisfied that that particular person is not associated with the crime. Because there's been many a crime that I've been involved in where clearly the partner has set up a scene to look like a burglary gone wrong. Shirley was nearly 20 years younger than Peter. When they met, they immediately hit it off. And Liz, who still cared for her ex-husband, was delighted for them both. Shirley seemed to share Peter's interests in the uh, car business, in the clients, even in the car parts. She seemed to be making the perfect soulmate for him. She seemed to be genuinely interested in anything and everything Peter was interested in. He said, I've been going for all these other girls, but, you know, I'm now learnt my lesson. I know they don't have to be perfect at all. They just be like Shirley, lovely girl. She wasn't very good looking either. She was quite the opposite. Shirley came across as being very much a mumsy type and when Peter was having access with the children, I felt that my children were going to be well cared for when they were with Shirley. You know, I was delighted that they thought of her as a second mum. Shirley became Peter's bookkeeper, but her main love was running a fashion boutique in the upmarket suburb of Brighton. She had no prior experience, but it didn't matter. Peter still financed it. That was her fantasy, and she got it of Peter. She loved to dress up, and so she'd always adorn something in her hair. Her um, dress sense was um, individual, <laughs> to be polite. So that was reflected in the choice of garments in the shop. They were very uh, idiosyncratic and plus very expensive. Not only did Peter fulfill his girlfriend's dream, but he was so smitten with her, he also bought her a house and the two became inseparable. We were fairly close, we were in touch regularly. Most nights of the week, about 7, 7.30, he'd ring me, I'd ring him, have a chat. But when he hooked up with Shirley, as happens with couples, all of a sudden, I didn't see so much of him. He seemed to have a dependency on Shirley, and I often said, why? Why would you need her in your life, even? But you've got to respect, that's his choice. As well as Shirley being a person of interest, police had delved into Peter's neighbourhood and council disputes. I think he stinks. Why do you say that? Oh, well, you only got to ask any of the neighbours and they'll tell you. But the idea of someone's irritation turning to murder was quickly dismissed. You know, there were people that didn't like him, but there's a difference between not liking someone and absolutely hating and wanting someone dead. But what aroused the detective's attention was the fact that Peter had been found tied up and there was bondage gear nearby. I was aware that Peter was into a form of bondage only on the basis that I went to his house a lot. I saw the bondage equipment and I used to ask Peter about it and he just said, oh, don't worry about that. Very strange. At the autopsy, defensive bruises were found on Peter's body, suggesting he had put up a fight. We also found significant injuries to the head, which we know would be caused by a blunt instrument. And there was bleeding around the brain, which indicates the force was significant. That can of itself cause death. Then there were the ropes. 
but none of these were tight. Most of the um, cord and rope type material was loosely, sort of almost draped over the body. So the thought of a sexual encounter gone too far was ruled out. But who had staged it? And what was the motive? Given Peter's wealth, an obvious form of inquiry the investigators would have taken would be to look at his will. Who's going to benefit? Peter's will was clear. He had left the bulk of his massive estate to his three daughters and a token dollar to each of his ex-wives. I think he'd even told me that he was leaving me a dollar, so, you know, it was sort of a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing to do that. It was, it was an old joke, sort of, that I saw it as. So neither the two ex-wives or Peter's new partner benefited from Peter being dead. In fact, Shirley was a witness to Peter's will. But according to Shirley, there was another will that left everything to her. And she turned up to Rose Craddock to find it. She made a demand of the investigators at the time that she wanted to go into the crime scene in the house. The investigators were still in control of the house and hadn't handed the house over to the next of kin. She declares to the investigators that she wants to look into the safe to see if there's a second will. The next day, in a recorded conversation, police heard Shirley discussing the matter with Peter's friend, Dale. Well, when Shirley called me, she was saying to me that she couldn't get in the house, couldn't go, go near the property. But the police actually did let her in that day. They didn't just say, yes, go in. One of the investigators went with her. His last will left mainly everything to his eldest daughter. No, no, I typed it all again. No. Because if there is a second will, and that would have opened up a whole new avenue of inquiry, There was no will there. I just don't know where it is. I thought he put it in the safe. Shirley had typed the will on Peter's computer, but the signed original was nowhere to be found. So, I mean, an unsigned will is worth shit, isn't it? If Shirley could find it, she stood to inherit a fortune. But it would also put her well and truly into the police spotlight. I've had enough. The whole thing has got to absurd degrees now. If any of your viewers want it, they can just come and take it. 56-year-old Peter Shallard had been murdered. And while the multi-millionaire had a fetish for leather and whips, the crime scene and autopsy suggested the bondage gear was a ruse to look like a sexual encounter gone wrong. So the initial examination revealed the head injury and some natural heart disease, which could have acted together to cause his death. But then a phone call came through from the toxicologist that changed that finding. We found morphine in the victim's blood and there's heroin in his urine. The heroin was a real surprise. This individual had recently had heroin. Now, this was really important information because the levels found were certainly capable of contributing to his death. So I rang the police and informed them of that. Heroin was in Peter's system, but what the history of Peter showed was that Peter was not a drug user. He was not a heroin user. When I heard that there was heroin in the system, that he'd been injected with heroin, I knew it was murder. It wasn't something he would do. The only drugs Peter took were for his bipolar disorder to help stabilise his enormous mood swings. But in a phone conversation five days after the murder and with the police still listening in, Peter's girlfriend Shirley was claiming she was making all the difference. Litigation day sort of died when you came on the scene. Yeah. Peter 
did not want to take his medication and that's another reason why he wanted her around. I don't think a normal girl would have put up with all this nonsense. In fact, a month before Peter was killed, he had rung his ex-wife out of the blue. I got a call from Peter and he sounded scared, fearing for his life. So we discussed who might be his enemy. He asked if I thought it was Shirley and I said no. So I didn't think it was Shirley. Shirley believed their four-year relationship was so strong that Peter had in fact changed his will a year before he died to leave her everything and his daughters penniless. So he loved me and I loved him. Everything was working out beautifully. Not leaving anything to his children, totally out of character for Peter because he would look after his children to the nth degree. He wouldn't let them go without. Apart from searching out the truth about the two wills, police had also begun to look at Peter's telephone records. And they noticed a spike of calls he had made just before he had been murdered. Peter called me and he said he wrote a check out for $250,000 deposit on a property. And that check bounced. He rang me and then he told me that 70,000 was missing. And he said, oh, Shirley has knocked off $150,000. He said there's money missing from his account and he said, I suspect Shirley's been stealing from me. But when Peter told me that, I wondered to myself whether that was bipolar talking to me or the real Peter Shellard talking to me. Not long after those phone calls, Peter was found dead in his bedroom. My partner, he's caught up on the floor. There's blood everywhere. Had Shirley deliberately changed the will? And was she her lover's killer? Shirley started the firm up as a suspect more than a witness. But the crime scene was telling a different story. The forensic team had been scouring the house for clues as to who had killed the multi-millionaire and loving father of three. Investigators knew that Shirley had spent time in the house, so it's not unusual to find Shirley's DNA or fingerprints there. But what forensic examiners would have been looking for is anything that didn't belong in that crime scene. And they were lucky enough to find a bloodied fingerprint on the phone. Whose blood could it be? Was it Peter's? Did he stagger out and come back in? They know that Shirley used a telephone is it uh, Shirley's fingerprint? They also find a cigarette butt. Peter wasn't a smoker, nor was Shirley. So there was every chance that Shirley may not have been involved in her partner's bizarre and brutal murder, and the police were looking at someone else. Well, we all thought Shirley did it. There's no one else. But now the results of the bloody fingerprint and the DNA from the cigarette butt had come back. It belongs to Sophia Stupas, age 31. She has several charges of possession, assault, petty theft and drink driving. The fingerprint and also of the cigarette butt certainly throws a bit of a spanner in the works. Here you have a low-level drug user, clearly you know that she wouldn't have been involved in the crime on her own. She wouldn't be able to control Peter at all. So you must have had an associate or help of some sort. And you find that she's associated to a fellow called Stan, who's also a, a low-level drug user. 42-year-old Stan Kalinikos had numerous drug and petty criminal charges, but he wasn't violent. Stan, he was a bit of a gentle giant, no form of violence. And experience tells you that a lot of burglars will not stand and fight. If they're interrupted in a burglary, they're going to take off. But in this case, Stan and Sophia, they've stayed there, fought with him and tied him up. To what end? They've clearly brought the ropes in and some electrical cord to restrain him. 
do they want to force him to tell where the money is or where the safe is, for example? Is it an extortion gone wrong? Has it gone beyond what they particularly wanted to do? And while heroin was the pair's drug of choice, investigators were confused as to why they might have wasted a hit on Peter. It doesn't fit their method of operation in doing the crimes that they have in the past. It just didn't make sense. What was clear was that Shirley had been stealing money. Peter's trusted bookkeeper had also been given the right to co-sign his business checks. Investigators found out that over a period of 12 months, 195 checks were made out clearly by Shirley. Shirley made each of those checks out to cash. So, in a year, she walked away from the bank with a whopping $914,000. And she siphoned the money into her luxury lifestyle and failing business. Shirley's business was some 200,000 plus in the red. And she was using Peter's cards in relation to the business. She was overdrawn some 43 odd thousand dollars. So we've got a bit of an issue there. According to Dale, Peter hadn't noticed his faithful girlfriend was a fraud until too late because he depended on her way too much. She was more or less in control of him, nearly. She was into the finances. She was so good that no one noticed what was going on around Peter. And nor did Peter. When Peter did catch on, he visited his bank and solicitor. He put a stop on Shirley's signature and was going to sell the house he bought her to recoup his losses. That was a week before he was killed. Peter knew money was being stolen and he was starting to wonder who he'd fallen in love with. She knew once the cat was out of the bag with the bounce check and Peter had counseled all the signatures at the bank that she was facing a not very bright future. Things weren't going well for, for Shirley. How does she get more money? Through the second will that may have, or may not have existed. His last will left mainly everything to his eldest daughter. No, no, I touched it all again. Shirley said the second will was made by Peter and typed by her in 2004. But when police seized the computer, it was a different story. What Shirley didn't know was that they can time and date stamp when, in fact, that entry was made of that will. And they found that that will was, in fact, made days before Peter's death. And the evidence continued to pile up because when detectives looked at Shirley's phone records, they hit the jackpot. It's identified that she, in fact, has called and been in phone contact day after and day prior to the murder with Stan. Stan's associated to Sophia. Sophia with a direct link back to the crime scene with that bloody fingerprint. Very damning evidence against Shirley. Surprisingly, the police decided not to arrest the three suspected murderers at that point. To go in too early is to show your hand. A bit like playing poker, I suppose. Investigations into homicides is methodical. There is no time limit. You just go along and get every piece of evidence. So you can be in the box seat when you interview these people. The strategy was to get evidence from one of the best investigative tools of modern day, their phones. We want to see what these people are talking about. That'll either support Shirley's innocence or support her guilt and the guilt of Stan and Sophia. We want to see what these people are talking about, what's actually been spoken between Shirley and other people, and Shirley and Stan in particular. But it was an extraordinary phone call police had intercepted between Shirley and Peter's friend Dale that swung the investigation into another avenue. Well, when Shirley called me, I, I said to her first, do you know who killed Peter? What's your view? It was on everybody's tongue. Who killed Peter? I've got a really good idea who it is, but I'm not talking to the cops. And that's what I want to talk to you about. 
Is it more than one person? Yeah. Big, greedy, dirty little druggies. Evidence comes from her own mouth. I know who these offenders are. They're dirty little druggies. All of a sudden, that druggy word comes in. And investigators would have known who these dirty druggies were. Stan and Sophia. They probably tortured Peter to, to open the safe and give them all his money. No, I know Peter didn't have money. I'll kill them with my hands and I'll make those bastards suffer. Here we have a live recorded threat that she wanted to kill these dirty druggies. The revealing phone conversation posed a dilemma for detectives as to whether to bring Shirley in for questioning or not. They would have looked at it and said, you know what, where would it take us? We bring her in, she says no comment. Oh, it was just an off-the-cuff remark. You've declared the telephone intercept to her, as you would have to. The case would be exposed to her and you've achieved nothing. So what do the investigators do technically? They look at a tactic of introducing an undercover operative. Two and a half weeks after Peter was brutally murdered, the police took a gamble. The undercover officer, known as Victor, made a call to Shirley saying he heard that she had a problem that needed to be fixed. And Shirley agreed to meet. It is a very delicate position to be in but it's a tactic that either is going to identify to what extent Shirley has played in the killing of Peter Shallard and to what extent is she serious about killing these dirty druggies. In their very first meeting, it was clear what Shirley wanted. The undercover operative said to Shirley, what do you want? Do you want them hurt, put in hospital? And her response was, I want them dead. And people might ask, well, why would Shirley want to kill Sophia and Stan? In my experience, drug users would pretty much sell their mother out. They are the weak link for Shirley. That's why they need to be removed, because they were Shirley's Achilles heel. Hence, the threat to kill them. Investigators wanted to be able to show beyond reasonable doubt that Shirley was in the house with Sophia and Stan at the time of the murder and that she played an active role in that. Shirley met Victor another three times and gave him two down payments for the murder. Then, on the last meeting, when Victor told Shirley he had done the job, the woman who Peter trusted with his life spilt the beans and told him that she was there on the night Peter was killed. That was enough for investigators to look at themselves and said, you know what, guys, we've got enough to charge these three offenders. And they would have then moved, and no one would be more surprised than Shirley when she got that tap on the shoulder and being told, you're under arrest for murder. Shirley, Stan and Sophia had now been arrested for the murder of Peter Shellard. But why had two junkies got involved with a woman who seemed to be so removed from their lifestyle? The answer was, she wasn't. Investigators speaking to Stan identify he was in fact supplying Shirley with drugs, amphetamine and heroin. Shirley had a substance problem that she had kept secret, but it had led her to Stan and Sophia. And in the months before Peter's death, the trio had become more friendly. Shirley would take Stan and Sophia to the casino. She would give them money for them to buy drugs. So when Shirley realised that Peter had found out about her systematically stealing his money, she knew the pair would be useful. And so she gave them her best sob story. She cocked and bulled a story to uh, paint Peter as the bad guy. He was the one doing her bad. She told them Peter had been forcing her into bondage and was about to sell her house from under her. So because Stan and Sophia were indebted 
to the support financially from Shirley. They wanted to assist Shirley. So, late Friday night, the 6th of May, Shirley rang Stan and the three met at his place. The plan was to teach Peter a real lesson about bondage and to get him to sign over the house to Shirley. They would do that with rope and a syringe full of heroin. Stan and Sophia told investigators that they went in there with the view of just tying him up and it did go to plan. I think he was lying in his bed. She's just jumped on him with a pillow. He was putting up a screaming fight. Peter put up a hell of a fight and I don't think they believed how strong Peter could have been. He sort of um, yelling, what do you want? The money's over there, like, um, he was pointing at this drawer and we said, you know, we didn't want any money. As they're struggling with Peter, Peter has bitten Sophia's finger. Sophia reacted, struck him to the head with a blunt object of some sort. And then they've tied him up. I was concentrating on tying the feet. What with? With the rope Shirley gave me, I said, uh, is that all right? And she goes, oh, no, 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 tie him, tie him more. The three then left Peter in the bedroom and went searching for the paperwork to Shirley's house. And then Stan saw Shirley going through her handbag and take something out in response to the moaning that was going on in Peter's room. I seen her grab her handbag off the kitchen bench she put her hand in it, and I assumed she was grabbing the syringe. It was the syringe Stan had seen Shirley put in her bag at his place. And she was heading for the bedroom. She said she was going to shut him up. He doesn't see it, but he presumes that she then further injects him with that heroin. And then the moaning had stopped. Not long after, the three left. Peter hadn't signed anything, but Sophia had left her signature behind in the form of a fingerprint and DNA on a cigarette butt. Telephone records then show that Shirley has contacted Stan. Stan tells investigators that that request was for more heroin and amphetamine and they needed to go back to the house for the second time. They then go into the bedroom and Peter's in the same position as they left him. Peter was dead. The blows to the head, the injection of heroin and a possible heart condition had combined to kill him. And then Shirley comes up with a brilliant idea. She instructs Stan and Sophia to open the window and climb through it to indicate to investigators there was a burglary gone wrong. And then they leave. Shirley then goes to work, business as usual, closes up the shop for that day, buys some takeaway and goes straight to Peter's house. At 6.50 p.m. she picked up the phone and either in her best Oscar performance or simply because she knew her golden goose was in fact dead, she made her distraught call to Triple O. Police and emergency services. Oh my God! <laughs> my partner, he's hung up on the phone. There's blood everywhere. When Shirley was finally arrested, I was greatly relieved because I wanted to see justice done. It couldn't happen soon enough for me. So, nearly two years on from entering Peter Shallard's house, Stan Kalinikos and Sophia Stupis pleaded guilty and were convicted for the manslaughter of Peter Shallard. They were sentenced to a maximum of six years in prison and have served their time. What's your name? Uh, Shirley. Shirley, was it? Shirley Withers was convicted of her boyfriend's murder. But she appealed, arguing that she, like her accomplices, never intended to kill Peter. Subsequently, the full Supreme Court agreed with her, quashed the murder charge, and she was subsequently convicted of the manslaughter charge. 
Shirley was given a maximum 13-year sentence with a non-parole period of nine years. She also pleaded guilty and was convicted for the incitement to murder Stan and Sophia. Shirley is now out of jail, having been released on early parole. To have this person that I thought was a great mother and soulmate of my first husband, to have her turn out to be just a thief and a killer was pretty shocking, really. I believe the world's a sadder place without Peter. He was highly amusing and good fun and entertaining, and he was dearly loved by his family and missed.